Uh, let's see, welcome everybody to the last day of uh, Pride Month 2021. Um, thank you for taking time out of your busy days to join us. I'm Dr. Benjamin Tubia. Uh, I'm a professor at the LA campus in the MFT department. And Michael, I'll let you introduce yourself. Hello, everybody. I think I know the majority of you, but for those of you I don't know, it's been a long time since I've seen any of you in person, but my name is Michael Velos. I am a PsyD MFT uh, student here at the Chicago School at the Anaheim campus, and Dr. Tubi is my dissertation chair, so what more, how fitting is this that we can actually do this presentation together, right? Yes. So. <laughs> um, we are here to give you one last burst of uh, Pride Month information. Uh, this came really at the bequest of another student and I was lucky enough to, well, I didn't give Michael a choice, but uh, do this with Michael because he is also extremely knowledgeable about this topic as well. And so we thought it would be great to, to present the material to all of you together. So without any further, oh, I wanna also thank Megan for making all this stuff happen all the time. Um, we wouldn't be able to get this stuff out if you weren't around. So thank you, Megan. Great. So I think the way Michael and I decided to do this is we're just going to go slide by slide and, 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 you know, each one of us is going to tackle this. So Michael, why don't you start? So our learning uh, objectives for those of you, uh, we're here to increase awareness and knowledge that the LGBTQ plus community faces by disseminating current information. Uh, for the sake of this presentation, we're gonna utilize the, the acronym LGBTQ. Um, one of the acronyms that the APA actually uses now is sexual and gender minorities or SGM. But for this uh, presentation, we're gonna use LGBTQ. Um, we're also here to advocate for the empowerment of the LGBTQ population by collaborating with the community organizations. Uh, if any of you need any resources, I'm located in Orange County, so I have an extensive list of different LGBTQ resources that you can uh, refer clients to if you're in the Orange County area. And then we're here to maintain accountability for continued improvement by providing the current best practices and working with LGBTQ identifying clients. Um, and as Dr. Tubi and I, we both know and the majority of you who know about my dissertation and what I'm talking about, we know that this is information that's not readily available and sometimes taught to people in their programs. So that's why we're having this conversation today. So I just want to double down on that last point that Michael brought up because I want to make something very clear. This is an introductory conversation about the use and benefits of using gender pronouns. Like any kind of dimension or cultural issue that you uh, learn about in school, do not think for a moment that what you learn in school is enough. And so this is at least a, a baseline for what, it's a palate cleanser, I like that better. It's a palate cleanser um, for uh, diving into to this topic, but please view it as an invitation to please do more discovery, more research, more learning on your own because this is not just to help people who are part of the SGM community. It's also to help all the other people who might not see themselves as part of the SGM community, but are questioning what gender means to them or how they express it. Yeah. So one of the things we wanted to do is we really wanted to make sure that we put out a non-discrimination statement really the values in which, so I'm just gonna read these off because they're pretty clear. Promote respect and equality for all individuals regardless of sexual orientation, gender identity, or gender expression. We value diversity within academia and our profession while providing equal opportunity to all qualified individuals, regardless of race, color, creed, age, marital status, sex, gender, religion, sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression, national origin, veteran status, or disability and any other dimension of identity that mm -hmm. can possibly or does possibly bring more color to the conversation. Highlight how gendered language serves to perpetuate a continuous subjugation of gender minority individuals and offer opportunities for correction and recognition. And then I also wanted to just plug in here, if, if, if some of you are not even aware of what a pronoun is. 
A gender pronoun is a word in the English language. I'm just gonna talk about English for now that we use to refer to people that we're talking about when we don't use their names, right? And so it's very easy to use someone's name. And, and for those of you who are maybe questioning your comfort of using uh, uh, non-binary gender pronouns, one of the tricks for people who are beginning this is, you know, just to refer people to by their name. Yep. Um, but, but gender pronouns are words that refer to people that you are talking about. So this is about people. And with that, we'll dive into it. So we're looking at the common acronyms and I want to um, highlight the fact that we're talking about primarily transgender, maybe possibly queer intersex individuals, but these are the letters and with the acronym for LGBTQ um, IA. So we have lesbian, gay, bisexual, we have transgender, like I said, that's the focus of what we're talking about with talking about pronouns um, and then queer, intersex and asexual. Um, I have, like I said before, I have a list of, of the, the terms and the, the I, definitions that we can, I can send those out to people. So we're not gonna spend too much time on like disseminating what each you know, word or each um, letter and acronym is, but I do have that information readily available if anybody would like me to send that out to them. One more thing I want to add to this is that because this is a beginner lecture, you know, it is common for people who are not familiar with this community to conflate the construct of sexuality and gender together. Yes. This is a very diverse community of people who identify very diversely. And one of the things that we'll talk about later, um, I wanted to bring up now is that to conflate sexuality and gender can be, um, uncomfortable for people who may be expressing a, a, a wanting to explore one or the other. Just because someone is gender queer doesn't mean that they are sexually queer. Uh, so, so please, as we dive deeper into this, remember these are two different constructs. And in this lecture, we will be talking about just gender. And we also wanna let you know too, that if you have any questions, write them down because at the very end, we're gonna have time for questions and answers. And uh, one of the things that we wanna make sure that you are all aware of is that this is a safe place for you to ask any question, at least of me, I'm, I'm not easily offended. I don't, I don't want you to ask, I want you to ask me any question you may possibly have because I'd rather you get the information from me and be able to use that with your client versus you know, asking a question of your client and maybe rupturing your therapeutic alliance. Thank you for that, Michael. I am equally as welcoming with your questions, no matter what they are. Between the two of us, I'm sure we could bring any kind of nervousness or curiosity to a head. Um, Michael, why don't we pair off on this one? Uh, I'll, I'll, we'll just switch off on this. So I'll start with sex. And when, when we use the term sex, sex, uh, sex is generally the term we use, or it, it, is, it is the term we use when we refer to someone's biological, physical um, genitalia. So that is a, a very specific term. You know, it has to do with your chromosomes, your body shape, uh, and secondary uh, sexual characteristics. It is not gender, mm -hmm. right? It has nothing to do with gender. So one of, the, one of the challenging things with sex is also when we present the concept of sex in a binary, we often overlook the complexity of sex, which is there are many, many different types of people that might have a vagina or a penis, but be sexual, uh, biologically, their biological sex may be diverse and not just fit into a nice binary. I'm trying to be very mindful of my language today. <laughs> um go ahead michael i was you want me i'll take the gender one so do you want to sure. do sexuality so, so for yes. gender identity oh go ahead so, I, so so because we're not going to talk about sexuality i'll just get it out of the way right now sexuality has to do with who you're attracted to it is not about how you identify so again it is not the same as gender and someone can be sexually attracted to someone of a different sex and then have identify as transgender and still not see themselves 
as gay or lesbian. So there is a lot of complexity here that I hope all of you can appreciate it. But sexuality is really who you're attracted to. Mm -hmm. And then gender identity, it's the person's internal understanding of their gender. It's how you identify. So for me, I was born cisgender, which means I subscribe to and I identify as the sex that I was assigned and I, uh, at birth. Therefore, my gender identity is male. And that's how I identify. So my pronouns would be he, him, and his because I identify as male. And so that's when we're talking about gender identity. We're talking about how a person identifies. And a lot of times that goes into gender expression. When I work with transgender clients, what we call is the expression is the way that they present their gender, right? And some clients, at least in this binary world that we live in, we look at very masculine traits. And I use that as like, you know, a beard or facial hair or, you know, um, different body structures or bone structures or whatever, clothing, we identify that as male. And so we'll be like, oh, that's looking at somebody that, oh, that's a man. Whereas feminine, we look at a little bit more softer, more dexterous. Um, and we look at that as like, oh, that's female. For me, working with uh, transgender clients, I had to rewire my brain to have the conversation with gender expression. And we, the way we talk about that is because people aren't always afforded the opportunity or in a safe environment where they can express their gender the way that they identify. And so I've had individuals who are trans women and their, their expression, the way that they present on the outside looks male. And so in my brain, I had to swap that this person is in a place where they're not safe to present their gender expression as female, but I still utilize she, her, and hers for the pronouns when I was talking to the client. And so when we're looking at the expression, not every person who is gender non-conforming or transgender or non-binary gender in that way. Say that again, Michael, because you cut out in the middle. Uh-oh, did I? Yeah. Um, I said the people who are gender non-conforming, transgender or non-binary may not present or be able to present in their gender outwardly in a way that's easily identifiable. And so you want to be aware of that too. Great. So that segues us into deconstructing gender identity and common terms and definitions that you might come by. There's one thing I want to make very clear here before we dig into this. Everybody has a gender identity. But this idea that it is a binary is a social construction, right? Gender identity can be anything, right? It's a spectrum, just like sexuality is. And so it's very important to keep in mind that any kind of binary that we believe in, whether what something is a masculine or feminine or somewhere in between is a social construction. It's something that we as society agree upon, but I wanna make something very clear. It changes like anything else changes that's socially constructed. If you took inventories on gender and, and what terms are associated to which gender over the decades, words that were used to describe masculine and feminine traits are different today than they were in the 50s or if they were 100 years ago, right? So it's very important to keep in mind that these concepts are always changing, maybe not as quickly as society, but they are changing. So with that, we're gonna go over four, four terms that you might commonly hear when talking to someone who is exploring uh, an identity that is SGM. Uh, so cisgender is a term that is used when someone believes that the gender identity that they have is aligned with the biological sex that they were born with. Okay, so it's 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 how you identify about yourself is assigned is aligned with how your sexual genitalia and your biological sex is determined to be. You want to go over another one, Michael? 
Yeah, so gender fluid, it's just a person whose gender changes over time. It's, I had to explain this to a group of colleagues the other day, and I explained it as like water, right? Water is very fluid and it flows. And so is gender. It doesn't stay within the confines of a binary. And so the way a person identifies today, the way that they also can present, maybe one day they present very masculine and the next day they present very feminine and their gender just is fluid and consistently changing over time. And it could be, you know, for a little while, maybe it's like three months, they present very masculine and then three months they present very feminine and then, or it could be day by day, but it fluctuates. Transgender is a term that is used to describe individuals whose gender identity is different than the biological sex they were born they were identified as, right? So it's just when they are not the same. And then genderqueer, just a person who identifies outside of the gender binary. Um, I only worked with a few people who identify as genderqueer. They, uh, the majority of my clients are uh, transgender or gender fluid. And this one, for me at least, the way that I've understood this in, uh, in reading and in research is that a person just doesn't fit in between what we would call as a binary as male and female. So I wanna add little asterisks to this conversation because I feel like in academia and in professional circles, we really value like clear definitions and words and labels that help people describe things and help us communicate things. I just want to make it clear. This is what maybe we as academics and professionals agree these terms to be, but somebody can very easily say, I am gender queer and have a different definition to that word, right? Yeah. Because we are talking about people self-identifying, please allow them to self-identify however they want. One of the things you can do as a professional and as a clinician and maybe as a researcher is to ask them what that term means to them, right? Because a lot of the time, some of the people who you're going to get as clients are going to be people who are in the midst of a, some kind of journey of discovery about what their identity is. And we want to allow them the freedom of labeling themselves at their own time. And when they do choose a label to ask them what it means to them. Deborah, I saw your hand up. Thank you. I just want to know, would it also include someone who is questioning their gender identity? Would, 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 what, would what include that? I'm sorry, with what? You said, we said, would that include somebody who's questioning their gender identity? Would what include that exactly? I didn't, what are you the referring labeling to? Labeling as gender queer. Again, I think it goes back to Asking. allow people to identify how they want and where our work is as clinicians is to figure out what the meaning of those labels are for them to mm -hmm. understand what it is that's motivating their, their connection to one thing or another. I'll give you one little example before we go to the next slide. I have a transgender female client that I see and you know, she labels herself an anarchist. She's like, I'm a trans anarchist. So that says a lot about like, you know, how she sees the world. But um, you know, we have these conversations of, you know, how she wants to express her gender and she wants to express, she still participates in this binary idea of what gender is, right? So I don't question her expression, but I question why are you operating in a binary, right? Not because I want her to not be in a binary, but because I want her to develop an understanding of how she's moving through these constructs. I believe it will make her, it'll develop into a stronger identity if she's able to grapple with these questions. But she is identified as, she does have an identity that she has uh, identified with. We, I, we, have, we have transitioned to a place where she feels comfortable identifying as a trans woman. And I, I'm question, I wanna know is gender queer can that be someone who is questioning their gender identity? Michael, what do you think? I mean, it could be, right? I think that if anybody um, is 
questioning or exploring, I like to use the word exploring, uh, gender. Um, I've heard people identify as gender queer. I've heard people identify as gender fluid. I think that some people utilize the word queer. Like I use the word queer as a catch-all. Like I'll say I'm a queer therapist. If you looked in the, the, the flyer that was sent out, I'm a queer therapist, but I'm gay. But I use queer as a catch-all. So some people may utilize gender queer as like a catch-all for them as okay. their, and then later on identify as, you know, gender fluid or transgender or maybe cisgender. You know, that's, but it could be a catch-all for some people. You would just want to clarify. You would just want to ask them, what does it mean to you? What does it mean to you? Yeah. 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 All right. Thank you. So, no problem. So, so one of the things we wanted to be mindful of is why misgendering individuals can be such a negative thing for those individuals, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, do you want to switch off again, Michael? Do you want to take Yeah, I can do this one. So for the negative impacts of misgendering, 50% um, individuals reported gender dysphoria um, leading to gender nonconforming or transgender individuals seriously contemplating suicide. And this was done um, for the 2021 Trevor Project LGBTQ poll. Uh, so for 60% of individuals who responded to this poll in terms of body dysmorphia, they experienced a high rate of body dysmorphia during quarantine. And typically how people um, mitigate some uncomfortable um, feelings around their body, especially if they are not able to, um, in order to like present either male or female. For trans men, sometimes they'll bind. And that typically is usually with a, with a chest binder, right? Something that compresses the, the breast tissue down so that it's not as prominent. Um, but some individuals utilize ACE bandages. And as a clinician, I think it's very important to be aware of that because there's health risks that could be contributing to the individual. That could be, you know, bruising of the, of the breast tissue, of the lungs, things like that. Tucking is an act in which an individual who's um, trans female will pull back their penis in order to have um, more of a feminine look to their lower extremities, essentially. Um, hiding the uncomfortable feelings of, of having a penis and being in the wrong body um, at the time. And so that also has health conditions that we wanna be mindful of as well. There are specific underwear that individuals could wear that will help with that rather than like using duct tape or, you know, and there's things that can go wrong. I've had clients who have testicular torsion, which is very painful. Uh, so I've heard, and we just wanna be mindful of that when we're assessing for safety. That's another safety concern. Um, out of the reports, 72% um, of the individuals within the sexual and gender minority uh, uh, community reported symptoms of generalized anxiety disorder, and three in four transgender or gender nonconforming individuals reported having experienced anxiety, and then 62% uh, percent of sexual and gender minorities reported symptoms of major depressive disorder, with two-thirds uh, of those individuals reporting were transgender or gender nonconforming. And so this is just some information that I found off the Treasury Project. I thought it would be important for you all to be aware of. I just want to highlight the fact that all four of these are diagnoses, right? They're in the DSM. And so this, the, the, the point of this slide is to show you, miss, people who are misgendered, one in two of them has a diagnosable mental illness. I mean, I, I really don't like gender dysphoria as a mental illness, so let's, I won't really go into that one. But gender identity is an internal concept, right? Gender expression is a choice on how you express that. But when people are misgendered, they don't see, the, it's, it's, an, it's a, a front to how they view themselves, right? It's a, it's a misalignment with how the world sees them and how they feel they are compared to how they are viewed. So it's misgendering is a very, very toxic, potentially toxic act for individuals who don't have a sense of solid identity and feel seen by society. Mm -hmm. So here's just some transgender statistics. Um, you know, 41% of trans people have been victims of hate crimes. 
40 of them uh, do not present for fear of prejudice or discrimination. Uh, their families don't speak to them. They get sexually assaulted at work. I mean, I'm just gonna leave these on for a little bit so you can read them. I, there's nothing more I can add. This is just to show you, you know, what transgender individuals are up against, right? These are statistics of, of, of the community, just so you can see how challenging it is just to be a transgender individual. Um, I do have clients whose parents have told me that I'm pushing them to become transgender or that something must have happened to them that they don't feel safe being the gender that they are, right? These are common misconceptions and statements by people who don't understand the complexity of gender identity development. Nobody would choose to be part of this community when these statistics are reality, mm -hmm. okay? This is something that people explore. This is something that people feel they cannot avoid because it is something within them that must be understood. Nobody is trying to not talk to their families or get sexually assaulted at work or, or, or have to get a, a clinician to sign a letter to have their gender and their sex match, right? Nobody's trying to, like, it's not fun, right? Yeah. Um, Michael, did you want to add to this or no? I just found that it was interesting when I was looking at the statistics about how many individuals were mental health clinicians, right? Like clinicians, like us, our people, our field are refusing to treat transgender people. And the, and the majority of the responses in which I was looking at this um, research was it was, it went against their beliefs, and so they brought themselves into the room and they said, I don't feel comfortable treating you. And one of the things that I've experienced when working with transgender clients is clinicians who pathologize or stigmatize transgender individuals and say, I don't work with that. And so I said, well, what brings you to session? What brings you here to see me? Well, my, my therapist said that they don't work with that. And that was a constant thing I kept hearing. I don't work with that as if that is something to be ashamed of. Yeah. So you have to like repair a therapeutic relationship before you even start, because you're, I found myself like apologizing on behalf of the field because of the things that people were experiencing from other clinicians. One more thing to add here. Uh, although we know this about transgender individuals, um, there are many, again, it's a spectrum. So there are many people who identify as something different than transgender or cisgender because it is so kind of unclear, there are no clear definitions. These studies generally, these statistics don't capture some more nuance that might actually be there. So there are groups of people who might not be included in these statistics. So mm -hmm. pretty much if you probably included them, these probably would be way higher, um, but that's like, you know, don't quote me on that. All right. So um, we had a slide in here about LGB statistics, but we're not talking about sexuality and I forgot to take this slide out. So we're not going to go over it um, because we have so much to go over in terms of gender affirming experiences. So again, Michael, why don't we, we switch off for this one? Sure. Uh, but we wanted to really talk to you all about what the benefits of getting someone's gender correct as they would like it to be is not just therapeutically, but in terms of their, their self-worth, in terms of visibility and politics and all of that. So do you want to I, take the first three and then I'll take the last three recognition sure. for validation? Sure. And so this is what I like to say to everybody. This whole entire conversation, I mean, if you're gonna take one thing away, it's about respect, right? Just respect someone when they wanna be called or when they ask to be called what they want to be called, right? We all get to ask for what makes us feel comfortable and as clinicians, just respect them. Your own views on gender identity or gender expression have no place in the life of somebody else. They do not need to be the cage in which they grow through. So, so please just asking somebody what they would like to be called or referred to is a form of respect. 
It also is a form of allyship. It says to individuals who are exploring and who are part of that community that I am a safe person to be with, to be around. I am not going to force you to live by my understanding of the world, but rather I will allow you the space and give you the support to be who you want to be because you get to decide who you want to be. That takes us to self-agency. People get to ask to be called what they want to be called. And that's it. We believe in this with every other identity. We believe in say self-agency as a principle of our ethical standards, right? So on the same vein, people deserve the rights and should be guaranteed the rights to refer to themselves as what they want to be. Now, as a narrative clinician, I'm going to add a little asterisk to this, right? Words mean a lot. So as people are exploring, Deborah, especially those who are exploring, we should also help them understand the language that they're exploring so they can understand why they're choosing to identify the way they do, right? it's important for them to understand the complexity of the language themselves if they're gonna explore other terms because they are so many other terms that they can choose from. Yeah. All right, Michael. For recognition, when you're utilizing someone's, you know, you affirm them with their, with their pronouns, it's bringing recognition to them as an individual. Like, I see you. I recognize that this is how you walk the world. This is how you identify. And that go, then all three of these bleed into one another. But recognition, you know, it's like, I'm, I see you for who you are as a person, which goes into the identity, right? This is how the individual is identifying in the world. And by utilizing their pronouns, you're telling them, hey, I'm validating your identity. And as a Bowenian, we're so throwing out theoretical, theoretical orientations here, the identity aspect is allowing the person to differentiate in where they are in the world, right? And then that validation provides them that what that they are as who they are in an individual person valid in, in the way that they identify. And working with clients, especially when they, as a clinician, like I think it's amazing when I, you know, ask them like, what's your pronouns? And for the first time I get to call them by their pronouns that they want to use in, set, in a setting with me. Like you can see this, this light in their eyes where like for the first time they've been validated by somebody because the majority of them, they don't, they don't get validation outside of the therapy room. They go to home to family members who are, you know, telling them that you're, you know, something's wrong with you. You have a mental illness or you get told by the media or you get told by, the, by society that there's something wrong with you and it makes you feel less than a human being. And so when you, you know, all, all of these together by affirming someone's gender identity and the way that they identify it, you can have such an amazing bond with your client and give them the ability to, to um, you know, make it through the day. Sometimes it's, it's hard for some people. And that's one of the things, especially with the pandemic, when the pandemic hit, so many of my clients were stuck at home in non-affirming places and their depression and their anxiety, their suicidal ideations all spiked. And just that one hour I had with them was just enough to get them to the next week. Great. So um, those are just a few of the benefits of gender affirming experiences. I wanted to bring you all attention to this flag. It's apparently what I've been told, the new updated flag. The 2021 uh, version? Yeah, the 2021 version. And <laughs> because we're talking about gender identity, the, the 2021 version added this yellow triangle with the purple circle, which is the, the flag for intersex individuals. So we're becoming more inclusive year by year. Um, great. So I don't even know if we need to go over these two, Michael, this and the next slide. Um, but I, we thought it would be great for you guys to see these and maybe you can use them. If you could look mm -hmm. it up, gender unicorn. And the next slide is the gender red person. If you haven't seen these, 
These are great visual tools to use with your clients or with their family members to really explain the complexity of this conversation to people who have not been educated enough. This one is especially good because it does not put gender identity, gender expression, um, sexuality on binaries. It actually puts them on their own continuums, right? One's <laughs> attraction to women or identification as a woman has nothing to do with their identification as a man, right? They can identify a little bit as each and that doesn't mean there are more one thing or another, right? So we, we see these, we see especially down here, physically attracted to and emotionally attracted to, we see a splitting of sexuality into a physical attraction and an emotional attraction, right? I think this was predominantly done for individuals who don't identify as gay, but may have sex with men if they're men mm -hmm. or, or don't identify as lesbian, but are women and have sex with women, right? Just because you physically have sex with someone doesn't mean your sexuality is one thing or another, right? Um, this is kind of the same thing, right? Yeah. Uh, so we won't, we'll, we'll skip this because I know you'll have tons of questions. Uh, so Michael, do you want to take this one? Yeah, these are just things to keep in mind when you're working with clients um, in the LGBTQ community. Uh, it's that identity development, it's a process. So like I said before, embrace fluidity. You know, people are at the same time when they're trying to develop themselves, which goes into the, the next one with individuals, like they're figuring it out as they go, right? There's no like set handbook, like here, this is how you do it. So when the individual, they're figuring it out in real time. So you can't expect them to have this, you know, clarity on what, what, what are you, you know? And, and it, it's a process. And that's one of the things I tell my clients, you know, and especially when I explain it to family members, like the client may be transgender, the whole family is transitioning along with them. So it's not just the one person. So there's confusion and narrative development are all part of the process. And then the gatekeeping aspect is it's no one else's job or duty to prevent someone from identify or from developing their identity. Like it's not your right or a privilege that you have to do that. You let people identify as, as they are and, you know, things change over time. And if someone is, you know, is continuing to identify one way, then that's okay. If they change their identity, that's also all right as well. So uh, only things I'd like to add to this is any kind of identity development, at least in a therapeutic setting, is a sacred space to be in as a clinician. And I believe one of our duties, this, I'm talking about what my belief is, is to make sure that as someone's identity develops in front of us, that we make sure it, it develops in a, as healthy of a way as possible, right? That if we can identify how other parts of their life or society may be negatively impacting that development, that we point it out to them. Right, so it's a very sacred space to be in, very privileged uh, opportunity to have as a clinician. So back to that bottom one is, we can't be the gatekeepers. We can just be the people who walk beside them and help them realize what the process is and really reflect on it so they can develop as healthy of an identity as possible. Great, so, so we wanted to share with you some common gender pronouns that people choose from. I will tell you right now, this is not an exhaustive list. More so, people can ask you to call them whatever they want to. So really, these are just, you know, what the literature says. If someone says, call me Z Zohar, then, then call them that to ask them what it means to them, but, you know, respect them. So um, before we go in, I just want to explain how I created this. First of all, I want to say thank you to Michael for making, taking a bland white uh, PowerPoint with black text and bringing all this color to it. Um, I could not do that. Um, <laughs> so the first three words that you see in every section is the subject, object, and the possessive. Um, the, the two words in black underneath them are the possessive pronouns and the reflexive ones. Um, I will say 
you will always run into people that may want to see me. I'm, I'm, I'm him, they, or I'm them and per, right? I'm just going to be very clear here. I'm not going to pretend like it makes sense to me because people can be called whatever they want and they can ask for it. Mm -hmm. The thing is, is just respect it, right? And, and, and what if you feel comfortable enough, maybe you can ask respectfully and curiously after you feel like you have a safe opportunity to, but it might not make sense to you, but it doesn't need to make sense to you. You just need to respect them. Mm -hmm. right? So, so why don't we play a little quick game if that, that's okay. I'm just going to call on random people and I'm going to be like, what's the possessive of per? And then you tell me. Um, and I'd like you to refer to yourself using that term. So say something about yourself. So Claudia, I'm picking, can you use the per uh, in a possessive pronoun? Per in a process, in a, uh, I'm sorry, possessive pronoun, right? Yeah. Mm. So it's the, the green card. I can't really see it, but I'm trying to. I can't make it bigger. So. Let me see if I can. Here it is. I just needed to switch my stuff around. So it's per, per, pers. Yeah. So so actually say this reflexive line using per. Okay. So oh. uh, So let's see. It's a dance. tongue twister. I got you. Though. I know. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> you're going to have to guide me through this one. So if I, oh. I would normally say she, her, and hers, but instead of saying that, I'll say per, per, and pers. Yeah, so so if you yeah. were if you were gonna use it for yourself, you say she thinks highly of herself. Now use per. Okay, so per thinks highly of herself. Yeah. Okay, yeah. got it. Debra. No, 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 I'm I'm not the one. <laughs> you are the one. You are the one. I want you to use the orange terms, the orange pronouns. And, and, and use the, the object. So they try to. See, you're terrible. <laughs> and so the well, it's, I think it's important to, to point out that the orange, green, and the purple ones, those are neo pronouns. So they're, they exist. I have not seen anybody utilize them. But they do exist, right? And so, he expects me to try and, and, and use the. Well, I mean, you use your own pronouns. Why not just replace them with a, another word? Just say something about yourself, but use the zer or zay or z. Use the zer or z. So the orange one, the first, I it. the orange I got it. one. I'm lost. I'm sorry. All right, William, do you want to try? Sure. So just to make sure uh, that I'm enunciating it correctly, too. It's so I'm familiar with Zay. I must familiar. I must say I don't know how to enunciate the other one. So would you mind walking me through that? Here. Here. Oh, D Zay here here here's here self. Okay. So I just want to make sure. Um, Okay, so object is the one you're referring to? Yeah. Okay, so let's see. The... Uh, so uh, I try to convince here or here. Yes. Okay. Got it. So, so sorry, I just wanted that. I thought that was fun. Um, I'm glad anxiety, you thought it was fun. More anxiety provoking, <laughs> one of the two. Oh. Yeah. Um, we so love you, Debra. <laughs> you will mo more commonly see he, she, they. Um, I think that's because these are just more popular. I've worked with people and met people who uh, go by the orange, green, and purple. And so I just wanted to add, I mean, there are more than just these, but I wanted to add them to, for you all to see how, how different they are than what you're comfortable with, right? They, them, they're, they're themselves is actually a very archaic way of referring to people. If you go back into English writing, that was actually a very common way to refer to individuals. These other ones are neo-pronouns. All right, 
So Michael, do you want to explain gender dysphoria? Yeah, so gender dysphoria, it's, I don't like to call it a mental illness. Um, I typically, it's, it's the only diagnosis that I have worked with where clients are excited to get it, to get this diagnosis because it opens, it, it opens up the gates for them to start to get treatments, uh, primarily for transgender uh, healthcare. So what we're looking at is assigned at birth, we're looking at the diagnosis and the diagnosis of gender dysphoria is just a psychological distress uh, is due to the incongruence between a person's assigned at birth and their gender identity, right? So how their sex is assigned at birth versus their gender identity. And the symptoms, what we're looking at, we're looking at the distress. Uh, we're looking at the anxiety, the depression that go with that. Uh, we're looking at premenstrual dysphoric disorder, which typically I've worked with with my trans men. And um, during the menses cycle, it's a very, it's a very anxiety provoking and even uh, increases the symptoms of depression. And so when we're working with gender dysphoria, we're not working with treating the dysphoria in and of itself, right? We're looking at treating the co-occurring dis co -occurring disorders and the distress that comes with it. So the anxiety, the depression, and how we remedy that is, like I mentioned before, um, binding and tucking. Those are some ways that people can do that physically. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to premenstrual dysphoric disorder, a lot of times when I'm working with the clients, I make sure that I'm talking with, I have the consent to talk with their doctors. And I'm making sure that, hey, I know this is coming up, the doctors will usually up birth control um, dosages as well as antidepressants and anti-anxiety medication during that time so that we can reduce the symptoms. Um, another remedy I suppose would be Hormone replacement therapy, right? For for my clients, hormone replacement therapy just supplements the hormones that they're not making biologically. And then gender affirmation surgery letters, that's a long-term remedy for the dysphoria itself. My and mom, I think, yes. Sorry, I, because you don't like the label um, and the of the, this diagnosis, I, I, I understand that, but I think, don't you think it gives some validity and uh, to the, the client to be able to know, at least I have a label that they can put on it so that I, I can get paid or the, the clinician can get paid so I can be treated for my symptoms, mm -hmm. you know? Um, it's, it's difficult for me because I know the history of yeah. psychology, psychiatry, and oh, yeah. sexual and gender minorities. So it's difficult for me to be like, hey, because people utilize the word mental illness as a negative, right? Oh, you're just mentally ill. And so I try not to utilize that because oh. I know that the, the DSM-5 is a medical book. Yeah. So I'm like, it's a medical diagnosis. It's yeah. part of a medical diagnosis. Um, but obviously, if I'm referring to like bipolar, that's a mental illness. Yeah. But yeah. for gender dysphoria purposes, I just say it's a medical diagnosis. Yeah. That's how I present it to my clients, because to me, that's just the way it's the least stigmatizing. Yeah. So Michael has graciously also included a couple of letters that you would use. Or the, I mean, I'll, I'll let you explain these, Michael. But one of the <laughs> things that I wanted to say about about this letter specifically in the diagnosis of gender dysphoria is that like all diagnoses, you don't diagnose without having a conversation with someone, mm -hmm. especially the person that you're diagnosing, right? Yes. These are labels that carry weight. Sometimes they may relieve someone of distress. Sometimes they might pathologize someone and make them feel even more distressed. Gender dysphoria is one of those that when I give it, I, I make it very clear to the individual that there's nothing wrong with them just because I'm diagnosing them, yeah. right? It is a part of our system and hopefully it'll change um, just like diagnoses change all the time. But because of that diagnosis and because of the way our system is worked uh, or, or has developed, a letter like this that Michael will go over and a diagnosis of gender dysphoria are just part of what treatment looks like for these individuals. Mm -hmm. So when I when I write these letters, um, a lot of times like I have here, uh, I will write these letters in support of my client, right? And I, and I used to do these when I did my traineeship at the LGBTQ center, I would see clients like, they're just coming strictly for the letter. 
because that's what's required by medical professionals. And so I would see them for up to three sessions. I'd write, get as much information as I possibly can, you know, duration of the symptoms, uh, the frequency of the distress, you know, the level of distress and what's happening. And I'd have this conversation with them and then I would feel comfortable writing a letter. Um, as a trainee, I got extensive training in working with the trans population. The majority of my clients were transgender and I just became very comfortable with assessing and writing letters for HRT and gender affirmation surgery. So if you look here at the subject, my client's uh, name, I use their legal name in terms of what insurance has because the insurance company is gonna wanna know what their, you know, who this letter is for. But I also have another name and this is all factitious information I just created myself, but I use Samantha Green and that's their preferred name, right? Because I have a transgender uh, female. And so I write the letter, you know, they present it to therapy on this day. They've, you know, they've come in for 12 sessions as of today, you know, presenting and that she's presented uh, for therapy for the purpose of discussing her gender identity and readiness to pursue hormone replacement therapy. And HRT uh, is the first step uh, before someone goes to getting a gender affirmation surgery letter. Uh, medical doctors are going to want them to go through a series of, of transitional periods where they're on, you know, HRT in therapy and things like that. And they're both very similar. This one here is just the gender affirmation surgery letter, but they're both stating that the client has been experienced, has been diagnosed with gender dysphoria, has been experiencing these symptoms for a duration of time, and that they have a support network or support group that they can, you know, go to, whether that's transgender related, uh, like groups, mental health groups, a therapist, somebody to help them. They want to make sure that they have some type of stable income, that if they do go through surgery, they're going to have a place where they can heal, uh, you know, appropriately, that someone's going to be able to help them, that they have, and it's a difficult process, so they want to make sure that they have support, you know, support systems and things like that. And then I go through the diagnostic criteria for the DSM-5 for gender dysphoria. And I say they present with this consistent with the diagnostic criteria for gender dysphoria. And I list everything on there. And I say, you know, based on California Insurance Gender Non-Discrimination Act, which is the law, you know, individuals cannot be denied access to medical necessity for transition related care. And this gender affirmation surgery letter could be anything. It could be you know, for speech therapy, I can write one for speech therapy for them to get uh, vocal coaching essentially, or I can have uh, for trans females who would like to have their facial hair removed, I can write that as well, right? And I have a whole list of medical procedures and then I sign it. And by me signing it and giving it to them, that's, you know, I tell them it's my professional opinion. I'm saying that this is my professional opinion that this person would benefit from and in this one, I put double mastectomy with male chest reconstructive surgery. Essentially, that's just top surgery, you know, and then they understand everything that's going to go on with that, the consequences of what this is. And if they have any further questions, they can contact me. I sign it. I give it to the client and the client can do with it, whatever. Some clients don't use it. They hold on to it. It's a security blanket. It's valid for one year, you know, and then after, after the year, if they need it to be updated, then they can come back to me and I can update it for them and give them a new one. So. So uh, because I want to be mindful of the time uh, and we're almost done, one of the things I just wanted to, to, to fast forward really quick, right? Remember what we said earlier, this is a safe space. You can ask what you want and now is the time. I put some, some random things over here just because, you know, these are common issues that people have, have expressed um, worrying about as clinicians. So, you know, well, I'm just gonna stop sharing now. And, and do you have any questions for us? We have about four minutes left, so. No? Speak okay. now. Go ahead. So one of the things you're mentioning in writing the letters is that there's a period of time or in which uh, that can be as, I believe I saw as long as 14 sessions. I even, I think I heard you, Michael, say that can be as short as three. I'm just wondering mm -hmm. what kind of, uh, if you can explain that process, such as the, like the intake, the types of themes you're looking for, uh, if there's any kind of formal assessment involved in that, if you could just explain that process a bit more that goes into uh, what informs you in writing the letter. 
Yeah, it's very informal, essentially, because there's no like assessment, right? There's no like, hey, I can print out like the BEX, the BDI and give it to them. So I'm, you know, I'm looking at what the surgeon's going to want to know. And I have in my sample letters, um, I have like the questions they're going to want to know. When did it start? How long has this been happening for them? You know, do they have a support system? Do they have some means financially to be responsible in order to get medication? Because sometimes uh, HRT may only be covered for a certain amount and then insurance deductible and things like that. Or if they're doing surgery, do they have a support system? Do they have someone that's going to help them? These are all questions, you know, are they going to continue care with a therapist during this time? And these are all questions that the doctors are going to want to know. And so I try to get as much information as I can from them, you know, talking about what is the distress like for you? Do you have any suicidal ideations? Have you had any suicide attempts in the past from this? You know, do you have a, a nurturing environment? What's your family like? Do you have a family? Do you have a chosen family? You know, these are questions that I'm asking so that when I formulate, I can present as much information as possible so that I don't have to go toe to toe with surgeons. And I've done that before in diff different hospitals, primarily religious hospitals. I've gone toe to toe with surgeons and health admin workers before because they didn't want to provide the service. So I guess I have a question that kind of ties in with what uh, William was asking, but what happens, for example, if somebody has Medi-Cal or if they don't have insurance? Um, there's a list of doctors that do some pro bono work. Um, I know that the LGBTQ Center in Los Angeles has a way to supplement for like hormone replacement therapy and they have resources out there. LGBTQ Center LA is a little bit bigger than the Orange County one, uh, but they have ways and connections to get people um, low cost or no fee hormone replacement therapy. So I always, you know, I have a client who can't afford it. I let them know there's some clinics here in Orange County that offer that as well. Uh, UC Irvine has um, a big, um, I think it's like a gender clinic where they do like research and they have means to provide low or no cost uh, HRT. In terms of surgery, that's a different thing because that's a whole different cost. So I don't know that many people who do pro bonos, but I know that there are clinic or there are doctors that do it. Any other questions in the last minute? Awesome. So happy end of Pride Month. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, again, if you ever need anything, Megan is the golden key to all of that. Her emails in the chat. Michael, do you have anything else you want to add? Um, no, I think, you know, just keep, you know, use this as a stepping stone and keep, you know, pushing yourself to learn more. And I, I know you can, you know, get my email from Megan, but my, I'm always here. If you need anything, you can shoot me an email. We can set up a time to talk and we can, you know, consult on things if you need help. Yeah. Oh, one last thing. If you make a mistake, right. And you misgender someone and you realize it, just say, I'm sorry and correct yourself. Yeah. Right. Don't let it go. If you realize it. So, um, all right. Bye. Thank you.